Are you ready for good talk? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we're certainly ready for good talk, and a very different kind of good talk this week. We're in Ottawa. We're in the Adam Room of the Chateau Laurier. And we're looking forward to a great discussion with, well, we'll let you explain who you are, because this room is full of really talented people who've been through the university process, some of them still a little bit, but most of them already in jobs that reflect their understanding, their knowledge, and their learning of the political system in Canada. They all have questions. That's the idea, and that's why they are gathering at the microphones now to uh, ask some questions of our panelists. And who are those panelists? Well, you know them if you listen to Good Talk. We have Chantal Hébert, one of the uh, finest journalists in Canada, political journalists in Canada, normally in Montreal, today here in Ottawa. We have Bruce Anderson, one of the uh, country's leading research analysts, polling, has a background in politics, has worked for politicians, has worked for both conservative politicians and liberal politicians over the years, and has a, an understanding of some of the things that go on in the background, and is still very knowledgeable and topical, obviously, on things that are happening right now. So let's get to... Uh, <laughs> let's get to the first question. So I, you know, it's great because every week I'm, I have to come up with these questions for them, but this week, you know, I'm just following the puck. And right now we go to this microphone over here, and our first question for today. Hi, thank you guys so much for being here. I want to start off with a pretty general question, but clearly we're in an era where politics and journalism is changing, and you all have very much experience and expertise in that, and I was wondering if we could start in the next two to three years, where do we see the field going? <laughs> I know, a huge question, but just to start. So where are we heading? It seems to me we're heading on a, a pretty interesting journey on the political landscape. Chantel, why don't you start us? Where are we heading? I knew that was going to happen. Um, it tells you a lot that we do this with no costs, no infrastructure every Friday, get an audience. We sit wherever we are in front of a computer, and we talk about politics. Uh, and that's great for us. But what it also means is that if you're starting off in journalism, and one day you're going to be like me, who started off when I was 21, but eventually you're going to have to pay a mortgage, have kids, that's not a great model. There is nothing that we do on Fridays that's going to pay a mortgage or uh, send kids to universities. And that is kind of uh, possibly the worry that um, Journalism, political journalism, or journalism of any kind will become uh, something that you do before you become a grown-up. And then you have to move on to something else because life happens. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you that I have an answer for that. But I am going to tell you that I totally believe there will be new models that will allow people to do what I did it's going to take a while. It's not happening now. I'm not one who believes that uh, we can save the old model and make it into something that works in the digital age. So it's still a work in progress. But I do believe totally that in as much as there is an audience, and it is there, I think we've seen it, uh, then there will be models that work. They will not involve building big newsrooms and great buildings at One Young or wherever uh, in, in the city. But um, I think there will still be people covering 
writing stories. I think society does need it. Uh, and I believe your generation is going to have to invent that model. The, the, the challenge for, for the journalists of today and the journalists of the future is exactly what Chantal was talking about in terms of we don't know what it's going to look like a couple of years from now. We didn't know what it was going to look like today, two or three years ago. Things have advanced so quickly. You know, like, I hate to use the example, but when I started in television, the film was black and white, and it was film. You physically had to cut it and stick it together to make an item. Um, look how fast things really have changed over the last half century and in the last five years, and we can only imagine what it's going to look like over the next five years and how that changes the journalistic uh, foundation for organizations in the future. Okay, the next question is for Bruce Anderson. Wait, Go ahead. Wait, didn't you introduce the internet? Didn't you tell people that the internet? I did was introduce happen? the internet. Right? I didn't say it quite like that. <laughs> well, it was, it was a very serious moment. I do remember seeing it, and it's out there on the interweb so it people is. can see it. Yeah, I think it, you should tell us there. more about well, where we're I, going I, now. I don't want to. It was the early 90s, and we had, uh, back in the days of the National and the Journal, and uh, I was doing both of them that night for some reason. And um, we had a feature story done by Bill Cameron, who's a great journalist, he's, he's passed now. Um, but he was going to explain this new thing. And it was new to most of us and, and to me. Just not and Al so, Gore. He and so, for you. And so, yeah, just Al Gore was the only one who understood it. But, I was up on the prompter and I was reading it and, and I said, now here's Bill Cameron to explain to us this new thing called the internet. That's how you said it. And, and that's it. just how the way I said it. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's out there now and it provides great laughs. But can I take a, a crack at that question or is that, is that not well, part of the deal? We, no, we no, want to no, keep moving. You don't moving. get a crack at it because oh, yeah. you uh, talk we, about We can the come video. back to it if, if, <laughs> if they run out of questions right, here, fine, which I'm sure they won't. Uh, go ahead. Hi there. Um, I, I think this might be a question for Bruce and also any of the other panelists. I was, in, in light of the, um, the late Right Honorable Brian Mulroney's uh, passing, I was wondering, um, if you could share um, a few, if you experience with, with the Right Honorable Meyer Mulroney um, in news media or just in your personal life and any good stories or that yeah. you've, uh, in your experience with him. Well, thank you so much for that question. I'm really glad that, uh, that you brought that up. And I, I'm gonna do the thing that Peter never likes us to do if we're taping before the actual release, which is I'm gonna timestamp this by saying today, uh, Mr. Mulroney's body is lying in state just down the street, and as my uh, my wife Nancy Jameson and I were walking over here, we were we were talking about him and talking about the meetings that we had been in in this building with him, in this room. In fact, um, you, you know, to some people would feel shame about this, but I changed parties a couple of times, and he was the one of the people who convinced me that it was important to change parties because I believed in some of the policies that he was championing and I got to know people like Mike Wilson and Lowell Murray and I spent time in the Progressive Conservative Party in this hotel including uh, with my old friend Bill Fox who I see here, good to see you Bill, uh, but I also did uh, debate coaching with Joe Clark on his return to uh, politics and with Jean Charest in the leadership race of 1993. So this building has a lot of uh, has abundant political memories for me. Uh, Brian Mulroney, in a room just across the hall from here, um, I remember this was the meeting where uh, I was in, being encouraged to help the, the Conservative Party after spending 10 or 15 years in the Liberal Party. And I was really quite tempted. I was pretty committed to the idea that I should probably do it. And I went to this meeting and it was, a, it was a breakout session after a big party planning session that was held here. And it was a cocktail thing. Anyway, there was this big long lineup and, and Nancy and I were at one end of the, of the room 
And Brian was walking through this long lineup with Mila, and he was meeting everybody the way that he did, and he was very physical. You remember that, right, mm -hmm. Peter? He was, a, he was always one of these guys. Before Bill Clinton learned the art of the two-hand handshake, Brian Mulroney was all over this. And he had grades of affection that he was going to show. And people in the room were so attuned to how he conducted himself that I see Bill laughing. He, he knows what I mean. You could tell the difference in the grades of affection by how much physical touching there was, how long the stop was, whether there was a little bit of a hug and a huddle. Brian Mulroney was the best I've ever seen in Canadian politics about that. And I say that in part because he did give me the hug and the huddle. And after that, I was with the party for a number of years uh, and happy to be in support of some of the policies. But the other thing I, I, I should mention is we put out a poll today that if you haven't had a chance to see it, Again, uh, Peter, let me say this. We put out a poll two days ago. Does that, does that work a little bit better? Um, which showed that 83% of Canadians asked today feel that Brian Mulroney did a good job uh, as Prime Minister. And those of us who were there during that time, and Susan Delacourt sent me a note today saying something like, I think my 1984 or 1988 brain is kind of blowing up at this evidence. Some of his policies were controversial. But in hindsight, people look at what he tried to do, and the measure that they took of it now is that he tried to do important things, he was well-intentioned, and some of those things turned out to be extraordinarily helpful to the country. So I'll leave it there. Trump okay, uh, let me reassure you that Brian Mulroney was not that physical with people like me. <laughs> so uh, we can clear that off the stage right away. No hugging, no, uh, I think Susan would agree with me. Though that did not happen, so don't walk away from here thinking that you judge. Uh, and also, Mr. Mulroney had a uh, a fair dose of respect for the distance between journalists and, uh, and people who are politicians. He was, um, and uh, he was the first prime minister I covered from cover to cover. But he was also the most interesting in the sense that the issues that we covered back in those days were real issues. Uh, they weren't uh, he said, she said which is uh, frankly not terribly interesting, but I mean free trade uh, the Constitution, abortion rights, which he didn't want to go into but fell on his lap. Uh, you go down the list, it's really impossible to imagine how interesting all those issues were. And he did something else for us. In those days, we had to follow the Prime Minister wherever he went. I spent too much time in Bécomo, I have to admit. Uh, and we never stayed in the same hotel as the Prime Minister, so I let you imagine what happens when you stay in the second or third hotel. Uh, they were good. I don't want the Bikomo people to write <laughs> nasty things about me. There was no shacks. But <laughs> we, we also got, uh, from Meech to the end of the Charlottetown referendum, we got to travel the country. And hear the perspective of all kinds of uh, Canadians, premiers, but also normal people. And if you're going to learn Canada, it's probably the best school you can go to. And the tuition was paid by the federal government, in a sense, uh, because you ended up in places where you would not have gone on holidays. I'm not going to name those places. I'm in trouble enough <laughs> with Big Uh But um, I think those of us, and we know who we are, who covered this era, um, know more about Canada than we ever knew going in. Uh, and that is on that prime minister. He was my best story. Thanks. Um, you know, I, I followed Mulroney from before he became opposition leader, so in the early 1980s. Uh, through the leadership convention in 83 and then his first election in 84 and then second one in 88. Um, we had the proper kind of relationship that journalists should have with politicians. Um, combative at times, um, always kind of, kind of demanding accountability and understanding on, on government policies. Uh, in his earliest days, when he was running for the leadership, he was, he was not very accommodating and, 
and, and hadn't himself sorted out what that relationship uh, should be. But over time, in terms of my relationship with him, uh, it became, uh, close would be the wrong word, but it, it respectful of each other's um, uh, positions. And after he retired from politics, after I retired from journalism, uh, we talked more often. And there were some, uh, some great conversations and real learning experiences for me, especially on international affairs, where he was uh, a wizard at, uh, with deep connections all over the world and understanding things. But if you followed the last few weeks, you hear constantly these stories about how he reached out to help people at difficult times. And he clearly did that a lot, uh, a lot more than I think any of us realize but we're hearing about it through these stories. I'll just tell you one little one on, uh, on my case. I, we were talking a few years ago when my son was going through uh, his final years of political science at uh, U of T. And he, um, he was writing a paper on free trade. And I told uh, the former prime minister uh, on the phone uh, that he'd been doing that. And he said, he interrupted me, he says, Peter, get me that paper, let, let me see that paper. And I thought, oh, you know, he's just, he's, he's just being Brian Mulroney. And I said, fine, I, I'll get it to you. And so I, I, uh, I, I, when he finished it, I sent it to him. And a couple of weeks later in the mail to my son came this letter from the former prime minister. And it wasn't just a one pager, an acknowledgement of, well, that was very interesting. Uh, I thought it was interesting, he made some good points and then signed it off. It went a number of pages detailing certain things. And now he didn't need to do that. He didn't, you know, he wasn't trying to impress my son. He wasn't trying to impress me, it was too late for that. <laughs> he was doing it because that's the kind of guy he was. And I think we, you know, we've learned a lot over these last couple of weeks by listening to stories, because there's nothing unusual about that. that was Brian Mulroney 100%. Um, and the kind of things that he, that he did. Uh, okay, next question, right here. Uh, perfect, thank you. So since we're in an event from the Mastering in Political Management in Carton, the only Mastering Applied Politics, most of us and the alumni either work in politics now or are gonna be working in politics. So as people who have covered politics from a journalistic perspective, what kind of advice would you give to future political operators or current political operators? You want to try that? Advice for political operators? You want me to do that? Well, why, why don't, I why, forget why, that. Why, why, don't um, you, why, don't, why don't you try that before we give it to the, uh, the former political operator? So I'm kind of in a room where they're training uh, people I would be up against um, in all kinds of ways, and you will lose uh, up against me. <laughs> Now, and why now you know why uh, I gave it to her. And why you will lose is because I have context and you don't. Uh, and I'm happy for uh, all of you who want to try this to get some experience in uh, politics. But you will all move on to something else for a while because whoever you work for is going to be defeated. Uh, that's normal and that's actually totally healthy. You will learn a lot from doing this. It's gonna be really tough. Uh, and possibly you won't know as much as you know until you move on to something else. And if you are, I'm not sure I would say lucky, probably unlucky, uh, you will come back to it because it's like a drug. And you will want to be back in because the only place, when I first came to Parliament Hill, I couldn't figure out as a journalist, you know, this place is kind of complicated, but it's also not very nice every day. And why would I want to be here? Uh, it's a bubble. And someone who was older than me and a journalist told me, because this is where every current in Canada comes to meet. There is no other place where that happens. 
So I wish on you, as you do whatever you do as staffers, that you realize that what is happening that is not whoever your workforce wish is also really important and interesting because that's where the country comes to meet. And over my time, you know, you first come here and you think this, this guy is right and this guy is wrong. And then you realize that what makes this place worthwhile is not who's right or wrong, it's that shock of ideas and the sparks from it. And I hope you treat it as an interesting experience and um, then move on to something else before you come back to it. Bruce. Oh, I think it's a great question and, and I'm so happy that we're here at this event and I'm so happy that this program exists and I say that in part, I mean it's terrifying to have all you smart people here um, in addition to my wife who's the smartest person I've ever known about politics. But, yes, yeah. <laughs> but part of the reason I say that is I was an extraordinarily undistinguished student at Carleton when I went there. And part of the reason why I was uh, so poor as a student is I was in the journalism program and I was working part time for $5 an hour for a, a, an MP uh, on Parliament Hill. And I would go to the MP's office and work as many hours as I could because $5 was a decent number at that time and I needed the money. And then I would go to listen to a political science lecture. I won't name the professors. Um, <laughs> but they would tell me things that didn't sound like what I was experiencing. Let me put it that way. Um, I know that's changed a lot and that this program, had it existed, probably would have been the program that I should have gone into. And I probably would have been a better student, although there's no guarantee of that. I was pretty distracted by politics. But what have I learned about what makes for um, a good political operative? I guess I would, I would say a couple things. One is that for at least about a 20 year period, there's been a, a currency associated with uh, the more hard edged, partisan, relentlessly ruthless uh, that you can be the better you are at that job, don't take that bait. Don't pursue that course. It does present the idea of rewards, notoriety, some celebrity. There's the idea that if you're that ferocious pugilist, you'll be on one of the talk shows, you'll be quoted by journalists, not, not to be unkind to journalists, but. Uh, not me, though. Not, no, not her. <laughs> Not her, but there is that, um, there has become that competition for who can be the worst junkyard dog uh, in politics. And it's a bad way to build your life, but it's also a terribly corrosive part of political life in Canada. And I can't tell you how many times since we started talking about Brian Mulroney's passing, I thought about, you know what? He was a partisan. He liked to drop the gloves. He said some pretty hard edged things. But he also championed really important ideas. And to Peter's point, he was a kind person. He, he maintained a humanity about it. There were limits to what he would do. And when those limits come down, we all suffer. And we don't know what the price will be until much later. But in my experience, that price is very high. And be part of the reversal of that trend would be my advice. We're going to take our first break, but we will be right back. <laughs> the Adam Room in the Chateau Laurier Hotel in downtown Ottawa for the Riddell reception. And we thank, as we, uh, as we will a lot, we thank Jennifer Robson and the staff of the political management program at Carleton University for arranging all of this tonight. We really appreciate it. And we're looking forward to hearing more of your questions, starting with this one right here. Hi there, thank you for being here tonight. 50 years ago, people would never discuss politics. It was like salary. You just didn't really talk about who you were voting for. 
To this day, my dad has no idea how his 81-year-old mother has ever voted an election and refuses to tell him. Nowadays, it feels like you can't get through a conversation without someone telling you who they're gonna vote for. What do you think has influenced people's level of comfort in sharing their voting information and intentions? And do you think this, this has positively influenced society or do you think this has contributed to the polarization we've seen today? Wow, that's a great question. Um, you know, we tend to, in these kind of things, hearing, hearing versions of different questions all over and over again. I've never heard that one asked uh, as directly as that. Um, Bruce, you study these things. What do you think the answer is to that? First of all, do you agree it's an issue? Or not an issue necessarily, but that it is the trend now where people aren't shy about talking about where their vote is placed and why? Well, I think there's been an evolution. Uh, there may be two waves to it, and we don't know where it's going to end up. I, I think the when you said 50 years ago, I remember um, the first time I was in this building. It was even more than 50 years ago, and I was here uh, campaigning for the legalization of marijuana as a young liberal. It took a long time to happen, but <laughs> I was, you know, I was four square into this is who I support, and I'm happy with that. Uh, but my parents' generation were for sure people who felt like you didn't really share that. You didn't talk about that with other people. It was kind of the, the notion of a private ballot, something that you did in the privacy of that ballot booth was, was really an understood social norm. Um, it wasn't that people were, vi were, were really unhappy if somebody did it, but it was just an accepted way of living your life and having conversations with other people. Fast forward to the last number of years, and maybe social media has been part of that, maybe the hyper-partisan uh, effects that social media have had, and to some degree, the polarization within the media. Um, I used to watch MSNBC quite a bit. I can't really watch it that much anymore because I find I'm not feeling like I'm getting anything other than partisanship. It would be the same if I was watching Fox. So there are a number of things that are encouraging people to express themselves as adherents to a party rather than a set of ideas, or even to a number of individuals. And I think that's not a great thing. But whether or not it's going to continue in that direction, I don't really know, because I do find, um, and Nancy and I spent a little bit of time in the United States in the last little while, and there were a lot of people that we ran into who said, we just don't talk about politics anymore because we can't. And I knew what they were talking about, as you do here. And I wonder if we're not headed more towards that that the polarization will create a social instinct to avoid uh, those divisive and painful conversations within families, within circles of friends, within workplaces. Uh, maybe that would be a good thing, although generally I think it's a good thing if people talk about politics. Partisan, partisanship has not been a particularly good thing in the last decade for sure. Okay, we're gonna keep moving. A question right here. Thank you for being here. Um, We've seen a increased politicalization of the media. Um, you know, we, we have the U.S. election, a, a former U.S. president calling the media the enemy of the people, and various different countries around the world restricting free press. Uh, I'm wondering um, what direction do you see Canada's media discourse moving forward in the next four to five years, and how can you and how can we uh, ensure that we have a free press in Canada? Can I just ask you whether, do you agree with either of those statements? One, uh, the, the media is the enemy of the people. I do not. Pardon me? I do not. And how about the, the first one? Uh, you suggested that an increase in the politicization of the media. With the, you know, certain political parties uh, making the funding of the CBC um, a political issue? Well, it's a legitimate issue. Uh, you know, to have that discussion, uh, where it ends up, uh, can be uh, can can cause certain divisions. Uh, but I don't think it's an illegitimate issue to discuss. Uh, but I, I hear your question, and I know that Chantel is eager to try and answer it. I um. I live in a different environment than many of the people in this room, and, and so the notion that you are the enemy of one side or the other is uh, familiar to me. Uh, when I worked for Le Devoir, 
I was considered a someone who worked for a sovereign newspaper, and then when I moved over to La Presse, I'd become a sellout federalist. So it doesn't really uh, affect me one way or the other. Like Peter, I believe that uh, the discussion on the CBC, like a discussion on Radio Canada, is legitimate, and if the people want it, they have a way to uh, let it be known. It's, but, but I don't think that um, there are no sacred cows or if there are, they're not good for the political conversation. So it should be possible to have these conversations and then uh, usually institutions come out stronger from those, uh, those challenges. And if they don't, probably they weren't meant to survive. But the notion that, um, you know, during, the, we covered the free trade election. It was clear that newspapers all had a point, uh, uh, an editorial stance on this. They were pro-free trade, the Toronto Star was against it, etc. cetera. Uh, same thing with almost all of the issues uh, that determine the future of the country in some way. That is the nature of the media. What you want is diversity of views, but uh, the media is not some neutral, pale thing that has no, uh, no thoughts. Journalists do what they do. I, and uh, when they're sick of them, they fire them and they move on to some other place. I heard something else in the question though, that at least at, to my ears, that question raised for me the concern I have about post media in particular in Canada. Um, I love the fact that there were daily newspapers all across the country and I believe that you could get different editorial positions taken in Halifax from Ottawa, from Saskatoon, and so on. And so I find there's something um, lacking when all of those newspapers have the same editorial in the day before an election. I don't love the idea that they all sell their front page to a political party the day before an election. Um, I respect that they have the, uh, the right to do that. There's no law against it, and there shouldn't be a law against it. But if we want diversity, that's not what it looks like to me. And so I do think that politicization, if it's intended to follow the cliques, especially if there's a rage farming aspect to it, um, it's not a healthy thing. And, and I, don't, I wish that we weren't seeing as much of it. But then he's assuming that people read editorials. <laughs> <laughs> Most columnists page, would though. say that's an, an interesting assumption. <laughs> And there's, you know, listen, there's nothing new about newspapers having an editorial position that goes back decades, if not centuries. Um, it's when, and this is a kind of crisis that journalism faces on the part of some of its readers and viewers and listeners, it's when that editorial opinion, which is kind of accepted as a place that should exist, bleeds into the news coverage. Um, you know, Bruce talked about MSNBC and Fox, and they become kind of the newspapers of, of our time in that sense. They have a kind of editorial position that is, is placed in their evening programming, which is all opinion stuff, and it leaves viewers worried about, well, what about their actual news coverage? Is it slanted along the same lines as their opinion coverage? And when you look at the, the data on why people have stopped trusting journalism, um, some of it is on that. It's on bias, it's on fake news, it's on disinformation and misinformation. Um, and the, you, you, know, you see the, uh, the concerns of people to the point where, you know, when, it, when people like Bill Fox and I were, joined uh, journalism and Bill was print and I was in television and radio, you know, the, the, among the most trusted professions in the country were journalists. They were up there in the kind of mid 70s in terms of percentile or percentage. And, you know, only beaten by, uh, you know, kind of doctors and Bobby nurses Orr. and, pardon me? Bobby Orr maybe. Yeah. And, and Bobby Orr and yeah. look what happened there. Um, <laughs> Now, 
today, depending on which you know, data you look at, research you look at, those numbers are down around 50%. Well, if we have that kind of level of trust in journalism, then democracy's in real trouble. If we believe journalism is one of the pillars of democracy, and only half the people trust it, what they're seeing, we got a real problem. Uh, and, and everybody has to address it, and journalists themselves have to address it. And there are ways to go about that, but that's a whole other conversation. Uh, before you do that. Okay. <laughs> I'm all for uh, all this trust in journalism in the 70s. Let me just note, though, that it was mostly male-oriented, um, unilingual on both sides of the divides, mm -hmm. which allowed people to tell other people about how one half was versus the other without any fact checking. Um, people like me did not exist in that golden era. And I'm not sure that that trust was uh, warranted. So I'll, I'll just leave that there. But uh, do not ask me to say that uh, what happened in the 70s and the trust, and I'm not taking issue with Bill or Peter here, but I'm not sure that trust was harmed. Uh, totally. Uh, and I do believe that the public should be skeptical of uh, journalism uh, and should not treat uh, what happens on the front page of whatever national institution uh, it is, be it the Globe and Mail, the Star, or La Presse, as gospel. Because my experience is that uh, there has always been some editorial stance seeping into the coverage. But I do believe that diversity is really important. And that is what is threatened these days. Not so much trust in journalism, but the fact that you get your information from a variety of sources. Uh, and those sources, the number of them are shrinking. And the means that they have, when I talk about Brian Mulroney covering him, there's no money to do that anymore. Political journalism is largely limited to Parliament Hill. That's not good. Uh, and that is where I see the crisis, that when there is no money and journalism is dependent on government handouts, the outcome cannot be good. I have never covered a government that was not tempted to control the press. And the people who sit in those offices over the top of us in the private sector, they live by what they tell shareholders. So if they're not going to have good years because they're not getting enough government money, do you really think they're not going to be sensitive to government pressure? I don't. That's my experience in the private side uh, of the media sector. See, it's great we're having this uh, yeah. debate in, in, you know, inside our own uh, profession, and we could easily fill our hour or a number of hours uh, you know, on that, because there are differences of opinion, uh, and they're strongly held. Um, but it's good that we're talking it through, uh, or trying to talk it through. Uh, I think I'm on, on this side over here. Uh, go ahead. And we got a lot of uh, questions, so we will try to keep our answers shorter, because we're running out of time. Hello. My name is Doris Ma, and uh, class of uh, MPM 2022. Um, I, I wanted to just let you uh, to know Peter and uh, Chantel, if I may call your first name. Uh, as, a, as a young immigrant, you two were uh, my introduction to politics in Canada, so thank you. Um, I have a quick question for you two, if you don't mind I ask. Um, can, you, can you share with us in your life, uh, decades as a journalist, can you share with us one point in your life when you cover a story that changed your view about Canada's role in the world? You want to go first or you no, want me to go, go first? <laughs> You're going to be good. At this. <laughs> um, well, uh, uh, Canada's role in the world, I mean, uh, I've been lucky enough to do a lot of traveling overseas and a lot of journalism overseas, and whether it was looking at uh, what we did as a, as a country in the First World War, in the Second World War, in Afghanistan. Um, you know, you see things. 
you see things in some cases you wish you'd never seen. But you see things where you see where Canada made a difference. And you're proud of what you see. Instead of talking about conflict ones, I'll, I'll just tell you, I'll tell you one example of a, of a different kind of conflict. Uh, 1979, exodus of the boat people from Vietnam. Hundreds of thousands of boat people came out of Vietnam. Persecuted because they were Vietnamese, Chinese. Um, they paid exorbitant sums to get their families out. All with the express purpose of trying to find a better, a better place to live and somewhere that the hopes and dreams of, for their kids could be discovered. Well, I was, I was over there. I went out in the sea, in the South China Sea. We saw boats coming in. We talked to some of these people. Um, and it was all about that. It was about how are my kids going to grow up? And I can remember being in a refugee camp in Hong Kong, and a woman tried to put a, her child in my hands. I was, you know, doing, you know, we were filming stuff and doing interviews. And she just wanted me to take her child, her baby, take it to Canada, where they'd have a chance. Now, of course, you know, I couldn't do that. It was very emotional. But what did happen as a result, and this is a good marriage of you know, journalism and, and, and government, because of the journalism that was done through that period, the summer of 1979 especially, by correspondents from around the world, they convinced governments, including this one, Canada's government, at that time it was Joe Clark, but Trudeau carried it on in the, in the year following, to bring these people here. Tens of thousands, and in the end there was like 120,000, came to Canada, made their lives here, gave those opportunities for some of those kids, some of whom I met later, not the same ones, but, but who came through uh, the, that process. That's where I saw a true side of Canada, through, things, through moments like that. You know, I've seen some ugly sides of Canada, but I saw that in that moment, and it made you feel very proud to say you were Canadian. So that's my, uh, my little anecdote on that. Um, do you want to try something, or should we move on? I think we should move to the next okay, question. Okay, we're on this we're side now, right? Mm -hmm. We're running out of time. Yes. Sorry, I won't say any more. Politics and security are so intricately woven together. I would argue war is the most intimate experience a human could go through. Whether through a journalist's perspective or a political perspective, how do you approach a situation that has validity on both ends and the real cost of life throughout the whole situation? I haven't covered uh, wars, and most of us don't. So I'm gonna let Peter try to, uh, <laughs> he's gone to war since I have not. Do you well, want to try I, in a general way first? Yeah, uh, on the question of what's the political response, I think one of the things that we're all learning through the tragedy that's happening in the Middle East now, or it has been happening for the last several months, is that at the end of the day, there's no substitute for um, using a moral compass uh, to identify the things that are wrong and to do everything that you can to, um, to eliminate them. And to, uh, I know what a, a delicate subject this is, and every time we've had to talk about it or had the opportunity to talk about it, we've been very aware that uh, feelings run very deep about this. But I, um, I can't help but feel that the lessons from the past about what constitutes good leadership are the ones that should guide us. And those, in the end, come down to if uh, humanity is suffering, uh, people need to deal with that. Um, and. Uh, uh, that means hard decisions. Uh, it means really thinking hard about how you communicate about what you're doing because people will understand different things uh, from the nuance, from the words, from the order of things that you talk about. Um, and so sometimes communications can seem like a way to obfuscate 
or to overly manipulate. I think in cases like war situations, um, speaking with honesty and a real sense of moral compass uh, and deliberation, uh, that's the most important thing. Uh, I think we'll just we'll keep asking questions here because we've only got, we've got about five minutes left. Yeah. This evening we've been talking a lot about how people are a lot more open about their political stances, but how they're also more polarized. I think as a result we're seeing an increased amount of cynicism where the level of political engagement isn't translating into voter turnout, which is stagnating or decreasing across the country. So what do you think needs to happen in order for voter engagement really to go up uh, and for democratic engagement really to increase in the next few years? Well, the experience has been that if you give people clear choices, they will show up at the polls. 90 some percent of them in a Quebec referendum, uh, one of the highest turnout in this country was the free trade election. And if you're just uh, doing you know, party lines, or if people don't feel that it, there, there is a choice to be made, uh, they won't show up because one uh, and the other, one of my first essays in the university was the conservatives and the liberals, and it was in French, uh, bonnet blanc and blanc bonnet, blue, white hat and hat white. Um, and there's been a lot of that in, in Canadian politics. So. Uh, the fact is that polarization is not great, but it, in theory, drives turnout. You know, uh, uh, if I can on polarization, um, I was just looking at some data today about this, and I, I see you know friends who are in the polling field or have been around it, like my friend David Coletto here, who knows this as well as I do, that polarization can seem like a, a really large phenomenon, but if you kind of break it down to how many people actually say, I'm right of center and I only want right of center policies and how many people say I'm left of center and I only want left of center policies? It's pretty small. You're talking about between 10 and 15% on both sides. And right now, you've got the plurality of people saying I'm a centrist but I want to lean a little bit more to the right on fiscal and, and taxation issues or economic issues, let me put it that way. And a, a similar size number, maybe a little smaller, saying I'm a centrist but I lean more progressive on social and environmental issues. Um, but what happens when parties need to get the clicks and raise the money and campaign and get the campaign workers out is that they tend to reach first for the people who have the strongest feelings in the marketplace and are most likely to respond. And that's part of you know, the way in which algorithms are distorting our society, maybe not for the better in some instances, let's be honest. But it doesn't reflect where the public is. And it, you see the same thing happening in the United States, where so many people wish that they had a better choice than the two that they see on offer right now, which is not to disparage Joe Biden. Uh, I don't have anything to say about the other fellow. <laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> right. Go ahead. Hi, I am an international student, so my question is nothing related to Canada. Um, in the UK, they are going very likely to have the general election later this year. And um, the UK share a lot of similar problems with Canada, like housing problem, the housing price, in, uh, interest rate, and talent issue. I wonder if you have any insight about the politics in the UK that can share with us in Canada. Well, they also have something we don't have, which is called Brexit. Uh, and, and the costs and, and the, the not really happy outcome from it. I think, looking from the outside, that it's pretty clear that the UK will go for regime change and the Labour government will be in place. But uh, this is, yes, there are parallels. And yes, most incumbents in most countries are in trouble, left, right, and centre, by the way. But in the UK, I don't think you can take Brexit out of the equation and the dissatisfaction with you know, this great thing that was going to happen if they voted yes, which obviously is not happening. I have one very small story that I want to, and I hope Dr. Fox won't mind me uh, telling this. But for me, Brexit is the thing that I focus on. And, and the act of choosing to have a referendum by David Cameron was one of the most foolhardy mistakes that I think I can imagine anybody making. 
And hopefully, if there are any uh, aspiring future political leaders, please don't ever do that. That's like a terrible idea. And uh, I raised uh, Bill Fox's name because he and I did a little bit of research on referenda and petitions prior to the Charlottetown Accord. And we looked at how they work. And we were a little bit horrified by how bad an idea it was. It didn't stop the late Prime Minister Mulroney from going ahead and having one, but we could see at that time it was probably not a great idea. It's a terrible way to turn over responsibility for decision making, in my view. We have time for one quick last question on this recorded portion. We're going to keep talking to uh, some of our guests in the room here uh, following uh, this, but this question first. I have uh, a question that's a bit beyond political theory. <clears throat> I'm originally from Prince Edward Island, and I've been here for about 32 years. I have Parkinson's disease, and I am concerned about the crisis in Canadian healthcare. Now, I'll tell you why. In Prince Edward Island, it's a small province, and there is about 138,000 people. There is pretty much no health care there. In the Western Hospital in Albert and Prince Edward Island, there's no doctor. So in Summerside, there is a big hospital there, and there's very few doctors. I think there's two. And I went to the emergency uh, room at Kenfield General Hospital a month ago, and I waited for 12 hours. There was a lady sitting next to me who had blood coming out of her ear, and I was wondering, what do you guys think is the solution to what is beyond political ideology, it, what is a real crisis in this country today? It's the health care system. Well, a lot of Canadians agree with you that uh, health care is, is, if not the number one issue, it's one of the top three. Um, I hate to do this because we've only got 30 seconds left. There's no easy answer to this, obviously, but what would you say? What can, <laughs> what, uh, you know, he does that what, to what, me. Yeah. Uh, 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 20 no, seconds now. I think I would say that we should devote a good talk to the issue. Yes, that's good. We should what? Devote another episode of Good yeah. Talk to the Issue because we can't do justice to this question in the time. I see the timer here. Yeah. I'm sorry we can't give you a better answer than that. Um, but uh, I think it's safe to say it's a huge issue. It has been not just for the last couple of months or the, even the last couple of years. It's been a continuing issue for the last 20 or 30 years. We pride ourselves on our healthcare system, and yet here we have the kind of stories like the ones you're telling. Uh, and how to get it up front on the agenda of the political parties to talk about substantive real change. It's gonna make a difference to people like you, those in PEI, but right across the country. So appreciate your question, and I appreciate all the questions uh, tonight. We really, uh, we're really grateful to Carleton University for organizing this. Um, through the political management program and uh, Jennifer Robson for uh, getting this all organized tonight. Thanks so much for your time. Good talk will be back in seven days. Spark conversation. Spark engagement. Spark action. Spark advocacy.